you have to make sure that the engineers, the data scientists, the AI experts, they are considered heroes inside of the company in the same way that they are heroes now in banking or like 10 or 15 years ago in Google's Meta, Apple, and so on. Hello, I am Carlos Gomez Arnau, principal in Hadrick and Stratos, Madrid office, and a member of the healthcare and life science practice. In today's podcast, I'm excited to speak with Iñaki Berenguer, managing partner at LifeX Ventures, a $100 million global fund investing in, at the intersection of AI and science. Iñaki was also the co-founder and CEO of Cover Wallet, a tech startup reinventing insurance for businesses. After growing to 500 employees and $100 million in revenue, Cover Wallet was acquired by Aon in 2020. Iñaki is also the co-founder and CEO of Pixable, a consumer internet startup acquired in 2012 by Singletech, the second largest telco in the world. He holds a master from MIT and a PhD from Cambridge University. Iñaki, welcome. Thank you for the invitation. What leadership challenges have you encountered in leading a fund that operates in the intersection of AI and science, and how have you addressed them? So a little bit about uh, what we are doing at LifeX Ventures. This is a $100 million fund that you explained, and we invest at the intersection of AI and science. And when we talk about science, it's mainly life sciences, although we may do something in material science and other disciplines. But uh, right now, we have invested in 35 companies, global companies, to third Two thirds of them are in the US, one third uh, in Europe. And, and our thesis is that AI is accelerating innovation in pharma and biotech. So that means that with less, you're going to do more. And then the second thing that is happening thanks to AI is acceleration of commercialization of the best science. So that means that the average person is going to have access to, to the very good healthcare, like with the whole concept of. AI bringing abundance to best doctors, best nurses, best radiologists, best surgeons. And, and the reason for all this happening is that biology, health, and chemistry are becoming digital di disciplines. If you think about the way you do science today, it's all related to zeros and ones because you are able to capture a lot of data. And, and with that data, you you operate that data on computers, and that could be genomics data, radiomics data, pathology data. Uh, you, you even have cameras that can go inside of your body and capture what is happening. And once you are able to capture that and digitize all that data, then you can simulate, do predictions, do uh, experimentations. Um, and yeah, that's why with less you are doing more. So in life sciences, mainly tools to innovate faster. And in healthcare, what you have is workflows that are automated because today doctors don't have the bandwidth to analyze all this data and AI can help doctors and nurses to make better decisions. So when you were asking what challenges we have encountered is that many of these companies were not used to have a lot of engineers, a lot of data scientists. They didn't have a CTO. They didn't have a chief data officer. And many of these companies, like they are called biotech or health tech companies for a reason. They, they need to have more, more tech people. So they, they, the well-established companies, they are making that transition, but they are not making that transition fast enough, which is good for the, for the startups that we invest in because the secret of success as an investor in a startup is to make sure that that startup captures a market share of the new opportunities before the large companies build innovation in-house. And because large companies are moving slowly at how quickly they are attracting that type of talent that is good for the type of companies that we invest in. And what areas of specialized knowledge have you needed to develop or add uh, to your leadership teams? So we invest in technology companies, and these companies already have the tech background. Some of them are being started by regular engineers from tech companies, like we invested, for example, in Veteromics in Silicon Valley. Veteromics was started by the CTO of Grail. They are doing diagnostic, like liquid biopsies. And if you think about the CTO, before they spent 12 years at Google. So someone from Google that is used to, to deal with large amounts of data goes on to this type of 
biotech or tech bio companies. Actually, the, the category is referred to as tech bio more than biotech because tech is even more important than, than bio. So some of them come from the tech world and they have to learn about biology and healthcare. And some of the companies are also studied from people from the industry, from coming from bio, pharma, health that are frustrated with the status quo or they identify opportunities, but they realize that there is so much legacy that will take forever to be reinvented inside of those companies. So they leave the companies and they start the company in, in tech bio, in health tech, and so on. But very quickly, those people are the ones that need to uh, complement themselves with engineers, data scientists, and this type of profiles. Fantastic. In your opinion, what are the key strategies for managing talent in a highly disruptive sector like AI, especially in an industry that requires this highly specialized expertise, such as health science? So you have to pay very well <laughs> and you have to retain talent, especially tech talent. You go to Silicon Valley, the best engineers, the best data scientists, the best experts are always looking for growth and companies have to offer a platform that that the individual feels that they are going to grow very rapidly, but uh, but you also have to pay people very well. And and in certain industries, like in pharma, where careers wouldn't move so quickly, people in their late 20s are not usually paid uh, high salaries versus in tech, that you have people late 20s and early 30s making half a million, one million dollars a year. Like everyone is talking about OpenAI, that the average salary is over one million dollars a year. So if you need to bring the same, same quality of talent, how do you feel comfortable in a big pharma company that may have 50,000 employees paying someone that is 30 years old these crazy salaries? And you may offer an attractive and exciting opportunity professionally, but you also have to pay salaries. In startups, like 20 years ago, like you were going to a startup, you were going there knowing that you were going to work in something exciting. We were working there for the stock options that had some uh, upside, but uh, but usually salaries were very low compared to incumbents and large companies. Now it's not the case. Like now you work in interesting things, you have the upside of the stock options, but you also get paid more than than in the large companies or the incumbents. So so you have to be ready to to pay that type of salary, otherwise you aren't going to retain the talent. And and you need to have that type of talent at every layer of the organization. Tech people, artificial intelligence experts, they want to go into companies in which they see in the senior uh, management positions experts in their categories. They don't want to report to people that they don't understand what these guys are doing, right? It's, that that happened also like about 10 years ago or 15 years ago in, in banking. Like when banking was being reinvented with technology, like thanks to fintech companies, large banks, whether it it was the large investment banks like Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or commercial banks like Bank of America or uh, Chase or like in Europe, like HSBC and so on. Uh, they need not only to recruit engineers or software engineers, but also like uh, tech executives that were in VP positions, senior VP positions and C-level positions because you needed to bring this type of talent al along or across every layer of the organization. You have to do that in, in pharma as well. And the most successful biotech companies and pharma companies in the last 10 years, like companies like Moderna, they understood this very well and they started bringing this, this type of talent very early on at every single layer of the, of the organization. So, and why is that important? Again, like going back to this analogy of what happened 20 years ago in certain industries, when traditional industries were bringing software capabilities, they were referred to them as the IT people. And IT was kind of like a negative way of thinking about these people as if they didn't understand business and they were not being treated as, as an important asset inside of the company. It's like the IT people, right? And now engineering, AI, data is becoming so important that those individuals, they have to build that. They have a seat at the table. They are considered as equals inside of the company, which is difficult because I have even realized this myself as an investor that there is still a little bit of classism in health and in bio that if you haven't studied a medical degree or you haven't studied biology, it doesn't matter whether you educated yourself with years of reading books and like uh, self-education 
like still if you don't have a doctoral degree a medical degree like they, they don't take you seriously and those people are getting, going to get frustrated so you have to make sure that the engineers the data scientists the ai experts they are considered heroes inside of the company in the same way that they are heroes now in banking or like 10 or 15 years ago in google meta apple and so on what capabilities do you see on the co- on the leadership teams of the companies you invest in and how are you finding the right leaders for those companies they have to, to to have the right combination of understanding the technology trends but also they have to be business savvy and by the way like some of these companies the original idea comes from academia but usually academics are, 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 don't have the skills that are transferable to build a product and scale the company like attract a talent, attract funding, attract partners. And some companies have been very good at uh, acknowledging that. And like the best example is Moderna, right? Uh, it all comes from research uh, being done at the lab uh, from Bob Langer, uh, the famous professor from, from MIT. But they brought in ourselves, that is the CEO of Moderna, that uh, was not an academic, right? He, he was coming from a diagnostics company and then he, he started a biotech company. But very well-trained, young executive with an MBA from Harvard. And and Bob Langer was not afraid of saying, well, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom and the rest of history, right? Like uh, Bob Langer is a billionaire, despite that, <laughs> that he owned very small percentage of the company. So it's better to own a small percentage of a large company than a large percentage of a small company. So you have to bring the talent that knows how to scale the company. And that doesn't mean that you are the best expert in the world or you have a Nobel Prize in in a discipline around what you are doing in biotech, right? So yes, the idea may come from a Nobel Prize winner, but who is putting all the pieces together and scaling the company is going to have a different type of skills. Great. And how do you see the integration of AI and science transforming the healthcare industry as a whole? And what implications does this have in its talent? So when we talk about healthcare, like at least from LifeX, we differentiate what is happening in life sciences and pharma and biotech. That is tools that are being used for doing discovery, like either pre- like all the things that you do preclinical, right? Is like in, in silico experiments, instead of doing them vivo, a, a lot of robotics that go into wet labs. So you don't need people running the experiments with a white coat in a lab, with looking at a microscope, like you are going to have a lot of robotics intersecting AI, and those experiments are going to be running 24-7 weekends and everything. So you are going to be able to accelerate the number of experiments. So we differentiate that that is happening in life sciences, but we also differentiate what is happening in the clinical phase. Like clinical trials are being accelerated thanks to AI and technology, but also how you find CROs that are going to help you to run them more efficiently, tools to or project management to coordinate multiple patients participating in the clinical trial, multiple sites over a long period of time. Also, like all the tools that you're going to be able to use once you get approved by the FDA, like all the market access tools to negotiate pricing between pharma and the payers, like all the clinical evidence that you need for for that market access. And so all that is, is being accelerated by AI. So again, like what I said at the beginning, that with less, you are going to do more. So before to bring a a drug to market, you needed to invest 1 billion from preclinical to clinical until you were going to market. Now with a fraction of that budget, you are going to to come up with new molecules, new therapies, new cell therapies. And and yeah, like with with less, you do more. That means that the diseases that were not being taken care of in the past because it was too expensive to try to bring a drug to market for a small market opportunity. Now, like uh, there are going to be new startups focusing on those corner decisions that before nobody was paying attention to because, yeah, like you, you can have a small team now finding a, a, a new therapy. So that is in life sciences. So we also differentiate what is going to happen in, in healthcare. And healthcare is about the payers, the providers, and the patients. So you're going to have a lot of tools going to into that. So the way we look at healthcare in particular is a two by two metrics. So there are going to be tools 
for the providers to cure people better, so more personalized medicine, more better diagnostics, better anticipation of what is going to happen, more monitoring of patients. So like that is going to cure people, but also they have uh, you are going to have tools to make the system more efficient. So when people think about healthcare, people think that the, the industry is, is so expensive because you have a lot of doctors and nurses, but the reality is that there's a lot of back office, right? Like if you think about the cost of running a hospital in the US, it's about a billion dollars a year. And people think that, yeah, of course, there are a lot of equipment, there's a lot of doctors, there's a lot of nurses. Actually, more than 50% of the people that work in a hospital system are not doctors or nurses, are back office people doing reauthorizations, customer support, uh, they are doing payment reconciliations. Actually, payment reconciliations, that is uh, the, the category is called revenue cycle management, like trying to understand how much the patient has to pay as a copayment, uh, trying to see whether you are going to cover and the doctors are in network or out of network, filing the claim uh, to the payer, the, the payer analyzing this and coming back to the provider, like could be a clinic, a doctor, a hospital, asking for additional documentation and, and more documents from, from the patient. So all the, that back and forth with AI is going to become much more efficient and, and everything is going to be uh, automated. So that is already 15% of the cost of running hospitals. So imagine like with that money, if you can have 15% uh, savings, how many more doctors you can hire. So yeah, like we differentiating the two by two matrix. One is uh, tools to cure people versus tools for back office. And then we also differentiate tools in the other access, tools for the patient versus tools for the for the providers, for the doctors, for the nurses. Uh, and with that, we are seeing out of innovation. Today, there is a scarcity of good doctors and good nurses. With AI, you are going to create abundance. Abundance, that means that one doctor is going to do the work of 10 or 20 doctors because of the amount of good tools or copilots, if you want to refer to them as, uh, as so. So every doctor is going to do the work of 10 or 20 doctors and do that even with better quality. Like uh, as soon as a patient e enters the door of, of a consultation, the doctor will have in front of them on, on their computer screen all the information about that patient, all the history, not only like, like the current blood test, but the blood test from six months ago, 12 months ago, three years ago, five years ago, all the images from CT scans, MRIs, all the genomic data, all the drugs that have been prescribed to that. And, and the, the AI gives some insights for the doctor to provide a more personalized consultation to that particular patient. But even when they have to prescribe a new drug, whether that, knowing whether that drug is going to have a side effect, whether it is compatible with some allergies or other drugs that the patient is taking. So all that, like that is the, the whole concept of personalized medicine. Like if you have migraines out of the 30 different drugs that exist for migraine, which one is going to be work better for you based on all these biomarkers that I have seen from your images, like radiomics, like genomics, proteomics, blood tests, and, and so on. So abundance in good healthcare, good nurses, good monitoring, and everyone in the world is going to benefit from that. And eventually people are going to live longer and better, right? This is not only about living 120 years, but making sure that the last 30 or 40 years of your life, you, you have like good vitality and, and good productive years. And linked to this, as you think about the mission of LightX, which is precisely to extend the life of people and planet, how do you envision that affecting how people think about their careers? So people in the general terms of people, not only people working in pharma, I think that we're going to live much longer. And But it's not only that, yeah, when you are 70, yeah, you, do, you don't have the vitality to, or you, you're not going to be as productive as you were when you're with your 40s. The thing is that it's not only about extending the years that you stay alive, but also the productive years of your life. The more professionals are going to work until they are 70, 75, 80, 85, and, and 90. I'm not a sociologist or economist to, <laughs> to talk about what are the implications for pensions and, and retirement, but uh, the reality is that people for the knowledge economy, people are going to be able to do the best job in, in their life when they are 70 or 80. And that also has some other implications. That is, if 
uh, life is moving so quickly and what you can do today is so different to what you could do in te- 10 years ago and what you will be able uh, to do in 10 years is going to be completely different, then you will have to keep reinventing yourself and you may study a new degree when you are 50 and you may change career when you are 65. Historically, you would study something when you were 18 until you were 22 or 25 or if you were doing an advanced degree until you were 30. And based on that knowledge, with just some updates during your career, you were able to continue performing the same profession for the rest 40 years of your life. Now you you are going to be reinventing yourself every 10 years because everything is changing so rapidly. Like I'm telling everyone that they know, whether they are in their 30s, 40s, or 50s, that they have to jump into what is happening with AI. And AI is not becoming a software engineer. In many of the tools that are going to be a, a, at your fingertips, like it's not only like ChatGPT, it's like a ChatGPT is like more like a consumer product, but all the tools that you can use inside of your organization that they are low code or no code tools. So without knowing anything about software engineers, you are going to become 10 times more productive. And with those tools, you are going to become a much better professional. And from a leadership perspective, how will this be affected? I think that the leaders are going to become tech leaders. So I think that this has happened in every industry during the last 20 years. 20 years ago, like technology companies were a subsector of the economy. So you would think about Cisco, Hewlett Packard, IBM, Google and, uh, or Intel, and then you would have other industries, logistics, banking, insurance, pharma, construction, logistics. Now, every company is a tech company, right? Like uh, whether uh, it influences or impacts the product that you offer or it impacts how you run your organization, HR, finance, sales, business development, customer support, everything is impacted by technology. So you have to understand what you could do with technology, and that is what has happened during the last 20 years, how software and tools are going to make the company competitive. With AI, is going to be the same in every single industry. So it has to start with the people from the top, at the board level, at the C-level, at the senior executive level, and then like to the manager and the individual contributors. So you need to bring this type of talent to the boardroom, but you also have to educate the senior executives because otherwise, people will continue talking about AI is going to change the industry, AI is going to change the industry, but they, they don't have any depth with those comments. They have to go one or two levels down of what implications it has for their organization, and people have to be aware of this because you have to know what you don't know, right? Like in, in the knowledge economy, you have what you know, then you have what you know that you don't know. And what you don't know that you don't know, right? So it's very important that you know what you don't know, right? Even if you don't know how to do the work itself, but you know that there is something that you could do leveraging that technology on those tools. So AI is changing everything in life and, and the work environment is, is going to happen faster than ever. And uh, we are seeing this, that uh, many companies that you would consider very traditional, incumbents, old school, they're already running 10 or 15 pilots of AI across the whole organization, the core product, but also like the the back office function. Final question. Looking ahead, what do you think is next for the healthcare and life science industry? And what can leaders do today to be prepared for that? I think it's going to change dramatically how those companies look like. If you picture a biotech company or a pharma company in your head today, you think a, a biologist with a white coat in a lab, with a microscope, with cell cultures, some Illumina machines are a freezer running experiments. And then there are some mice there that they run the experiments. I think that is going to change dramatically. Like, like the pharma company and the biotech company in the, in the, of the future is going to be a lot of people in front of computers running ex- experiments at the speed of AI instead of, a, of, the spe- of the speed of biology. With mice, you run the experiments on models of AI with billions of parameters that a model are models of of a mouse, and it's going to be very different, and and that is going to happen much faster. But the company itself is going to look different when you enter. The same for a hospital. When you think of about a hospital today, and when you enter in a hospital today, what you see there and your experience is going to be dramatically different in ten years, and and this is going to happen much faster than what people think. Iñaki, thank you for making the time to speak with us today. Thank you.